support actually as we get started here. Jack, you able to hear us? If not, you can go ahead and you can introduce yourself in the chat if that's easier for you. All right, we'll come back to Jack. Uh, G. Malacco. Hello, I'm from Family Care Council here in Palm Beach County. Thanks, Jean. Jennifer Harris. Hi, Jennifer Harris, Special Needs Advocate for 211 Palm Beach Treasure Coast. I do have one bit of information. Are we doing a little info sharing? Yes, please. We hired a part-time um, special needs advocate for St. Lucie County. Her name is Christina Cabral. When she gets her phone set up, I will disseminate all the information. Great, thank you, Jennifer. That's so exciting. Thank you. Kelly Kearney. Hi, I'm also, also with FAU's Academy for Community Inclusion. And just a little announcement, uh, if you know any adults with an intellectual disability who are interested in going to college, we are currently accepting applications. Uh, and I'll put the link to that um, from the website in the chat. Thanks, Kelly. Kimberly Jackson. Not sure if Kimberly is connected. Keith Borkney. All right, hold on. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, hey Keith. Oh, hey. <clears throat> uh, Keith Borkney, I'm the Executive Director of Employ You. Uh, we're a nonprofit employment service uh, working with vocation rehabilitation. And uh, we are happy to announce we have a, a new gentleman just joined us named Anthony Schwab. He is our new employment specialist in West Palm, and he's actually going to be working in the Boca area as well. We're looking to open a new office in the Boca area, too. So. Great, Keith. Thanks yeah. for sharing. Uh, Maria Rojas Lopez. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Maria Rojas Lopez. I am from the Early Learning Coalition of Palm Beach County, one of the customer resource managers. Um, just to keep promoting the um, voluntary pre kindergarten, you know, parents, um, this is the season to start applying for the one that is starting in August or that goes to the summer in 2023. Um, also, um, to apply for the school readiness and the scholarships that we do have, we believe that very soon we will be able to, uh, you know, start. Um, inviting parents over to um, to the program. So if any of you know of any parents that are in need, give us a call. We can guide them. We can let them know how to apply, what they need, et cetera, so they can take advantage of the program. Great. Thank you, Maria. Marcia Martino. Hi, I'm Marcia Martino from um, NAMI, Palm Beach County. Great, Marcia. Thanks for coming. Mary Ellen Queen Looney. Good afternoon, everyone. Mary Ellen Quinlani with FAU Card Director. Nice to see you all. Thanks, Mary Ellen. Millery Senat. Hi, everyone. My name is Millery Senat. I'm the community liaison for the Agency for Persons with Disabilities. Thanks, Millery. Natalie Eno. Good afternoon, everyone. Good to see everyone. I'm Natalie Eno. I'm the Family Resource Specialist with the Early Steps Program. Thanks, Natalie. Nicole Clark. Hi, everyone. I'm Nicole Clark. I'm the CEO of ABA Cares of Florida. And I want to give a heads up. We are looking at scheduling some more dates for our free parenting classes. Um, this time it'll be on Zoom. So, Natalie, I'm going to call you soon. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, Nikki Karatsa. I always get my name so well, thank you. <laughs> and it's a hard one. My name is Nikki Karatsa. I am with Behavioral Family Solutions and we provide ABA therapy for children and adolescents. I also have one of my work associates with me who is gonna be working more in the West Palm area. So I wanted to introduce her to the group and get her more involved. This is Brooklyn Vincent. 
everyone. Nice to meet you all. I'm excited to be here and I look forward to continuing to be part of the organization and join on all these types of calls as well. So thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Um, Pat Murphy. Hey, Pat. Hey, this is Melissa Foster and I'm actually filling in for Pat today. She was tied gotcha. up in another meeting. Hi, Melissa. <laughs> thank you. Have a great day. Yeah. And Melissa, why don't you talk about your who your organization that you're representing? United Community Options of South Florida. Uh, we serve uh, adults and children with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Perfect, thank you. And I see Randy Gabriel. Hey, good afternoon. This is Randy Gabriel. I'm the programs manager for 211. And I'm also the parent of two young adults with disabilities. Awesome, thank you, Randy. Uh, and Randy Palo. Hi, Randy Palo. I'm a director here at the Children's Services Council, Palm Beach County. And I apologize, I'm going to have to go in and out of this meeting because I had other things that were scheduled at the same time. <laughs> Thanks for coming, Randy. We appreciate it. And I see Raquel, she introduced herself in the chat, business relations with BR. Raquel, did you want to say something? Okay. And Riona? Hello, I was trying to unmute myself, sorry. I'm Riona Maharaj and I'm with Legal Aid. I'm also in the Education Advocacy Project with Erica. Perfect, thank you, Riona, thanks for coming. Sasha Spritz. Hello, my name's Sasha. Um, I'm a U.S. Immigration Specialist. I am Thanks, Sasha. You broke up a little bit. I heard the beginning part. Maybe you can enter it into the chat. Let, um, I was going to say, Carrie, that, that's just, Matt, you Carrie, that's just my it. wife. I just, I just asked her to dial in, so I, she Got just it. wanted to see the ball. Yep. Okay. All are welcome. Um, Tammy Fields. Hey, Tammy. Good afternoon, all. Uh, Tammy Fields, Director of Palm Beach County Youth Services Department. And I'm going to put in the chat um, that our summer camp scholarship parent applications are open and they um, all applications need to be in by April 15th. And we do have a, a few summer camps that um, are providing services for children with uh, special needs. Perfect. Thanks for the update, Tammy. Tracy Press. I keep praying every time you call on people that it's my turn and the dogs are quiet. So I'm going to do this quickly. <laughs> Tracy Perez, Regional Executive Director for the Center for Hearing and Communica uh, Communications. We serve the deaf and hard of hearing. And we currently have um, funding for individuals for hearing aids, um, evaluations, any assistive devices for the Palm Beach area, as well as any um, academic tutoring is free for any students in the Palm Beach area that are deaf or hard of hearing. Thanks, Tracy. Your puppies did a nice job. <laughs> Veronica Pappas. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Veronica Pappas. I'm a parent. Nice to see so many familiar faces. Um, I'm a parent of two individuals. Uh, one of them has uh, various diagnosis that I won't bore you with. Thank you for having me and thanks for everything you all do. Thanks for being here, Veronica. It's so important to have parents um, attend these meetings, I think. So, um, all right. So, and I see Jack. Jack, is your mic working? I see your introduction there. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I'm Jack Kosick from Lakeland. I'm a special needs housing consultant and I'm also a member of the DD Council. Whoop, whoop. Right. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, I saw someone come in, but I can't remember who it was. Who has not been introduced yet? Oh, it was me, Cristiani. <laughs> I just hi. Uh, hi. Go ahead, introduce yourself. I'm sorry, I was on another meeting. Uh, I'm Cristiani Salgado, and I'm from uh, 21B uh, Boca Raton uh, unit from VR. Perfect. Thank you for coming. Not a problem to be late. We're all running in a thousand different directions. I just didn't want to miss anybody. Did I miss anybody else? So thankful to have such a nice audience today. 
All right. So it looks like we're gonna get underway with our presenters. Um, so we have a list of four panelists today um, that are going to be talking about um, Tallahassee and what's been happening in Tallahassee and um, what you should be on the lookout for and what was approved. Um, so they will speak to that much better than I can. And I'm so excited to learn all the information that they're gonna share with us today. Um, so first up, I'm gonna introduce Margaret Hooper um, and uh, I'll introduce three at a, at a time. Margaret Hooper, Olivia Babis, um, and Caitlin uh, Clibon. Did I say that right, Caitlin? And you all can give us some information about your organizations and um, the mission of the organization and what you all do and your role. Uh, Margaret, I'll turn it over to you first. Okay, thank you. Um, I am the Director of Public Policy and Advocacy for the Florida Developmental Disabilities Council. And um, uh, I'm in charge of the council's legislative platform every year, and we I go up and educate legislators um, a lot by Zoom the past two years, but um, uh, work with them and also uh, work with self-advocacy groups. And, um, you know, right now I talk to people about what happened during session from my perspective and from what the council worked on. So, um, I guess I'll start there. Uh, the session ended at 1.03 p.m. yesterday. Uh, Signe died. They needed uh, extra time. They were supposed to end on Friday, but the budget, uh, it took a while to get the budget um, agreed upon in conference when the House and Senate come together to agree on the budget. And then it has to cool or at least be available to be read because it's 300 pages at least. Uh, so um, for 72 hours, and that's a statutory requirement. So instead of making people come back on Sunday, I think was around when it would have been done, uh, the legislat legislature was called back on Monday and they just spent probably an hour uh, talking about it once again. They had already debated it um, that Thursday and Friday before. So you might ask, well, why did it take so long to agree on everything? And, you know, every year is kind of different. They have different things they agree on or disagree on. I think Medicaid managed care changes were something they were um, arguing up to the last minute. Also, um, I don't know whether any other way to say it, but penalizing uh, 12 school districts for not um, following the mask regulations that the governor had um, done an executive order on. So there were different discussions around that, but also mostly it was trying to spend all the money that the state has because I think our revenues up more than was projected but also between the last administ federal administration and this one, we had a lot of federal relief money. So um, I've heard some representatives say it's 40% of the total budget this year are federal funds. So when I tell you that they had $8.9 billion of the budget to be able to put in reserves, that I've never seen that. I've been doing this for over 17 years. And I've usually, I think the most I've seen is to, somewhere between two and three billion. So 8.9 billion in reserve, and then an extra 1 billion on top of that for um, what they're calling inflation needs. So they're predicting, especially with rising gas prices, that Florida is going to have some challenges around inflation. Now, I'm not sure what that fund is supposed to do, I think it's at the governor's discretion to use it as things come up, as needs emerge. Uh, in addition to that, there were raises for state workers that totaled 664 million. Um, there were, was 363 million put towards affordable housing programs. Uh, fatherhood was a big initiative this year and $65 million was put towards supporting fathers, encouraging fathers, and things to do around what's defined as a fatherhood crisis. 
Uh, the most money I've ever seen for K to 12 student funding. I mean, I've seen for years, I was seeing two to $3,000 at the most for per student funding. And this year is $8,142.85 per student. Uh, and then 170 million for cybersecurity. In addition, this, in addition, there's tax holidays, 14 days for a sales tax holiday for disaster preparedness, uh, expanded days for sales tax holiday for back to school. Uh, there's a recreation sales tax week. There's a, something called tool time that I, I just hadn't noticed to, um, till I looked at, I'm gonna do a shout out to Representative Andre for having a really great email that with really good graphics that um, I saw this morning. And uh, in addition, an additional challenge that the legislature had this year was around um, redrawing the, leg the congressional districts and they did um, get maps for the Senate and House districts. I don't know if the congressional ones have been signed off on by a judge yet, but um, that goes on every 10 years after census. So who you, you know, you might wanna check at some point and make, your, cause your representatives might've changed or what district you live in could have changed. So, um, the budget that our primary legislative priority for the council this year was called pay fair for my care. And that's because there was a crisis in direct support professionals. And they, they're the, probably the most important service for individuals trying to be included in the community. Whether you have a physical disability or an intellectual disability, a lot of people need those direct supports. And um, this was already a challenge before the pandemic, probably with a 40% turnover, at least back then. But then after the pandemic happened, um, you had uh, people, this wasn't, you know, the profession people were running to right away, because of course you were gonna be working one-on-one -on -one with someone exposing yourself to possible COVID-19 or giving it to somebody else. Then we saw that um, this was happening nationwide and also in nursing. I think you could say nursing, but our, we decided to focus on direct support professionals who work for the iBudget waiver, um, which is the home and community-based waiver program, an alternative to institution under the Agency for Persons with Disabilities. So, um, just to give you a big picture, uh, it's something unusual is that usually the Agency for Persons with Disabilities runs a deficit. And some years they're really politically kind of taken over the coals for that. But they have a tough, they have two budgets, two budget rules that they're working under. The, the state government says every agency must balance their budget. And then the feds say everybody on Medicaid who needs medically necessary services gets them. So it's, it's always been a challenge since this program started and um, the agency started to balance that budget. Well, this year they had a surplus probably for only the second or third time since I've been working at the council. And um, the good news is instead of that money going back into the general revenue pot, it gets to get beyond reserve in case the agency needs it this year, which is wonderful news. Um, in addition, there was um, additional money from the Relief Act that still hasn't completely been appropriated yet to providers, but that money can also be used by the agency as well. So. Um, so the pay fair for my care campaign, we wanted something, a living wage and for people with uh, direct support providers to have. And really that's probably closer to $17 an hour. But a lot of these folks are working for $10, $11 an hour. So 
my job was really easy when the Senate president came out pretty early on saying, oh, we want $15 an hour for every direct support professional um, that works for APD and um, that works for the state and also the direct support professionals that work for ACA. Well, the House didn't agree at first. They were sticking with $13 an hour, but through budget conference, they came out very quickly at the first health care meeting and said, no, it's going to be $15 an hour. So um, our job now is to try to make sure that when they can start spending it, that they do as quickly as possible. Now, they're going to be strict about this. They are under penalty of perjury providers who are paying direct support professionals have to say that they're honestly going to get $15 an hour. Um, and I've never seen that language before. Uh, at first, they called it a memorandum of understanding, but now they're calling it a, um, uh, a supplemental wage agreement. So um, the reason they're doing that is because by 2026, the state has to have a minimum wage of up to $15, and they were going to raise it a dollar per year. But they want this to already have fulfilled that requirement. So they want to make sure that that's really happening. And in fact, they have language that by 2023, somebody could file a civil suit if they don't have that $15 an hour. So that was wonderful. Now, you know, well, getting it implemented is always um, the biggest challenge. So we'll be watching that. In addition, there was $59 million, and I'm including the 60 plus percent federal match uh, in that 59 million fig figure to get transition people off the waiting list for the waiver. As many of you know, it's the waiting list is over 21,000 people. Uh, this that amount of money will take care of, they estimate about 1,100 people, which would take care of their seven waiting list categories, and that would take care of the first five, move into the sixth category. Now, the seventh category, as you all may know, are children under the age of 21, which I know is a particular focus for you all, unless there's a crisis. If any of um, children, particularly over age five, is in a particular crisis situation, they may be eligible for those funds earlier. But a crisis a pretty, you have to be homeless or a danger to self or others or a foster child. Uh, another piece of good news was $8,500,000 for dental, dental work, which has always been such a, an underserved need. Uh, they also continued to fund $3 million for the ARC mobile dental program. So you have a total of $11,500,000. $11, now that $8 million will be, um, people can, they're going to put it out to bid and see who wants to provide those dental services. So um, that's how they plan to fund that. So those are my budget highlights. And then I'm um, moving on to um, talk about some of the legislation this year. Were there, did anyone want to add anything of, of the panel regarding the budget? And not so much regarding the budget, um, just to kind of track back to the um, congressional maps for redistricting. Mm -hmm. um, the legislature produced two maps. <laughs> so there is map one and then an alternate map two. Um, the governor says he does not like either and is planning to veto them. So we're waiting to see if he's going to follow through with that veto. And then there may be a special session called um, to either override the veto or to produce a third map, maybe. Um, so that's kind of where that stands right now. Oh, thank you. Is that, that's not for the House and Senate in the state, that's congressional. For the House and Senate, for Florida's House and Senate, um, the governor does not have veto authority. So once it passes the House and the Senate, um, the Supreme Court reviews the maps. Um, there may be some court challenges 
pursue that in, in court. So we'll see what happens with that. But the governor really doesn't get a say in the um, state. I, well, they went through one court process and did pass. The, yeah. um, they the, but the congressional the ones, I guess, are really under in turmoil, it sounds like. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so we'll wait and see. We may end up with a special session for the congressional maps. Um, that's what people seem to be expecting to happen. So, okay. Um, the second thing we were working on this session is um, the concept of supported decision making for individuals with developmental disabilities and. Um, this last year it didn't get heard it got heard in one committee this year and language was moved into chapter 393 which is a chapter specific to individuals with developmental disabilities so it was taking away all the arguments of of guardianship that applied both to people with disabilities um, and with seniors because we had a lot of um, input from elder care attorneys and I'm uh, it was heard once and I'll, I'll let um, at a when they do their presentation um, Olivia and Caitlin will have more information I want you to all to understand what that does so they'll explain it to you because I think it's there's another guardianship bill to um, House Bill 1372 that is specific to the school system when you turn 18 because there's four extra years remember um i think it's under idea that students with disabilities can access in the public school system but they are technically could be adults so it's that transition that they'll explain to you um some things that are trying to happen there because that's really where some people can have a guardian when they don't really need one in the school system uh and i'll also let them share with you the pushback <laughs> what our challenges are for the future and working on that. Now, the council was also working on a social service estimating conference bill, um, and that would put APD's I budget waiver in the social service estimating conference. So again, they won't have, they'll have a better estimate of the money they'll need. So they won't run a deficit, for example. And there's a lot of, since this is an optional Medicaid program, the legislature hasn't wanted to put it in there, but kid care is an optional program. So um, we've been trying to work something out with them. It may become a study. Uh, Senator Osley has been working on that as well as Representative uh, Carlos Guillermo Smith this session. It did not get heard, but it generated some discussion. Um, another bill was um, the restraint of students with disabilities in public schools. And you all remember last year that a landmark legislation was passed um, that I had been working on since 2009. And um, it uh, prohibited uh, seclusion rooms and also made brought restraint up to the bar of only when there's imminent danger and various other positive things. But the one huge negative thing was they were allowing mechanical restraint by school personnel. So this year, um, Senator Book and um, Representative Placencia came back and fixed that so that school personnel um, will not use mechanical restraint at all and that school resource officers will be able to use it, but only for children age grades six through 12. Um, so to me, that was um, to see something come back to fix a bill that quickly was um, really amazing. And um, again, Olivia and Caitlin were kind of in the trenches working on that one because we've all worked together um, on that for so long and they can tell you more about that as well. Um, we're, we're lucky because we have Representative Tant and um, is my representative here in Leon County. And she has a, um, she's particularly a champion for disability issues because she has a son with Williams syndrome. So you'll hear a lot, you know, she has, was working on a supported decision-making bill, but she also got a bill passed this session um, extending 
the funding you can get if you have a child with a developmental delay to age nine or the second grade, whichever comes first. And right now it was up to age five. So parents were finding themselves in a predicament of having to have a diagnosis for their child in order to get services that may have been too early a call to make that diagnosis. So um, this is something I think advocates have wanted to see for a long time and it passed. Um, another bill certificates of completion by um, Representative Valdez and um, Senator Jones. It passed all the way through the House. Um, well, it got into the House, and um, but it only made it into the second committee on the Senate side. And what that would have done is some educational programs require a high school diploma. And as you all know, a special diploma um, they stopped that a few years ago, and they've really tried with access points to make a diploma work. However, for some people, they just are going to get a certificate of completion, but they still could work. So this was going to allow um, people who had a certificate of completion to be able to access more post-secondary and work programs which is also something advocates have wanted for a long time. So I hope they try again next year to do that because the fact that the house passed it is very encouraging. Um, another bill that, um, that I'm sure that I worked on with Disability Rights Florida was the Registry of Persons with Special Needs Bill. Um, and it was also called the Protect Our Loved Ones Act. So this sounds great right out the gate, right? Boy, we're gonna protect our loved ones. Um, but at further looking at um, the original version that was filed by Senator Broder and Representative Placencia, uh, it was gonna pretty much let people that said they were your caregiver put you on a list um, of somebody who um, law enforcement needed to be aware of just to make sure that communication would go smoothly. I mean, that was the intent. So sometimes people with, you know, autism or other kinds of mental health issues um, may not react in a way that law enforcement officials would expect. Then it got they were going to connect it to a criminal information database where just criminals are on that. Then they were going to connect it to DMV. Then a house had a version to um, associate that with the D on the driver's license bill that passed a long time ago, well, a few years ago. And the big concern there is having people with disabilities be connected to a, a criminal database. And, um, and then some you think of a law enforcement might use that information in a gentle, thoughtful manner, but it also could make them, if they're not trained, in a very different manner, expect aggression, expect problems, you know what I mean? So anyway, an amendment was filed to finally to probably with the advocacy of Olivia and Caitlin to um, make that more of a, um, a, they decided a compromise was to make it a local law enforcement bill and not connect it to criminal registries and the, some guidelines around that. So um, we were neutral with it. We were opposing it and became neutral when it became a local, because probably some of that goes on informally and this gave some guidelines. Um, but I think you'll hear um, a stronger opinion on that when, um, when Olivia and Caitlin share with you that bill. But anyway, it was temporarily postponed in the last committees it was in, but we're concerned about seeing it next year. So we'll be looking out for that. Then there was a Medicaid buy-in uh, program. And Medicaid buy-in is if you get a, a job, uh, you can, you're on Medicaid and you get a job that'll put you over the Medicaid limit to keep Medicaid, 
you can actually buy, it's a federal program where you can buy into uh, continuing to get your Medicaid. So you act like it's your insurance program and 47 other states have this or 46 or 47, it um, changes sometimes, but have this program, Florida does not. We have some other little niche programs, but a, a couple of representatives are, were wondering why we didn't have this. And um, Senator Pizzo and uh, representatives Woodson and Smith and uh, also Senator Jones all filed Medicaid buy-in bills, but none of them were heard. And another bill that interested um, some of our family caregivers was to, as a family caregiver, find a way to become a certified nursing assistant. And that bill was heard in one Senate committee by Sen and it was Senator Powell's bill. Uh, it was not heard at all in the House. But it's kind of an interesting idea that you could be paid to be the certified nursing assistant, especially because that's another profession where it's hard to find certified nursing assistants. It's hard to train them about the intricacies your child with special needs may have. So um, sometimes that's a good option. There was a bill that, um, that I referred to, the, a bill to, um, smooth the guardianship uh, transition and uh, during your, when you turn 18 in the school system and I'll let Olivia and um, Caitlin talk more about that one. Then you may have heard about the in-person visitation by essential caregivers bill that did pass. And uh, what was happening is that when the governor put out an executive order to kind of freeze everything. That's when kind of when we were going into lockdowns and hospitals, nursing homes were closing the right to have a visitor. This became really problematic if you were an essential caregiver. For example, essential would be defined as somebody where the loved one will only eat if you're the one feeding them or really needs help with communication. Um, situations developed where people were um, were looking at a hospice situation um, and couldn't get an essential caregiver in to at least be with them when they passed. So um, this bill would have guidelines for um, that make it very clear that an essential caregiver in different circumstances would be allowed and uh, a variety of healthcare settings that are congregate, including group homes, assisted living. Now, the argument against this was, um, well, when the governor dropped his executive order, everything should have gone back to normal with a patient's bill of rights. Unfortunately, that wasn't happening. And legislators on both sides of the aisle were getting calls saying, I can't visit my loved one, they won't let me. So this makes it clear. And um, also it, some of the groups like the senior um, services associations liked the, um, the, the final product they came up with and signed off on it too, which was encouraging. And then I've only got two more here. There's one that, um, that uh, private instructional personnel for, that do applied behavior analysis services, or essentially it's a bill that allows behavioral technicians to be in the classroom because if they have certain um, certifications, because in the past, only a really high level behaviorist was allowed in the classroom. And a lot of those folks oversee behavioral technicians and don't do that kind of work. So this is something, again, that people have wanted for a long time, and um, that bill passed this session. And then an assistive technology advisory council uh, bill passed, um, making that council more effective and refining some of their policies. But I, when I was talking about behavioral, I forgot to mention that there was um, a solid rate increase for behavioral services for people 
as well. And, um, and then I just want to name off some of the services that are going to benefit from the $15 an hour. And that would include behavioral technicians, personal supports, respite care workers, and people in, um, living in facilities that use re residential habilitation. So that's my presentation for, um, for today. And do you want to save questions to the end after we've all gone through? Yeah, I think I think since Olivia and Caitlin are um, kind of piggybacking on some of the topics, why don't we do that okay, at least? Right. We can we can see if we want to take some questions before Matt and then or after um, as okay. well. So, all right, Olivia and Caitlin, you're up. Thank you so much. Hi. So I am Olivia Babis. I'm the senior public policy analyst at Disability Rights Florida. Uh, Disability Rights Florida is Florida's protection and advocacy organization. Um, we're federally mandated, so every state has a PNA, um, is what we refer to ourselves as, um, along with seven U.S. territories. So there are 57 PNAs nationwide, and we provide le uh, free legal and advocacy services to people um, across the disability spectrum, um, from children all the way up to adults. Um, you know, and then touch on a, a bunch of different issues. Um, I have been on staff for about three years. Um, I actually started with the um, Centers for Independent Living Network, uh, working at a Center for Independent Living as a peer mentor in Sarasota, um, and then came on board here. Um, and my background is in um, policy and campaigns. So I come from um, that world. Um, Caitlin and I do most of the lobbying for Disability Rights Florida, along with legislative education, outreach, and providing resources. Um, and I manage um, most of our um, voting rights work, which we refer to as our PAVA funding, um, which is protection and advocacy for voting access. Um, and, and Caitlin works a lot on Baker Act issues and mental health, um, criminal justice issues. Um, so I'll let Caitlin introduce herself in a moment. Um, we're going to kind of divide and conquer with our issues here because we, we touch on a, a broad spectrum of issues um, for session. Um, so I'm going to go through and kind of talk about elections and voting, um, court and general government issues, um, health care, and then a little bit on education. Um, so we had legislation that passed last session. You probably heard it talked about a lot in media um, with the voting bill that passed SB 90, um, which is currently in litigation. Um, the trial's over, waiting on a decision from the judge. And there was more voting rights legislation this session kind of building off of the changes from SB 90 last session. Um, so last session, they, they made a lot of changes to um, the vote by mail program um, with COVID during the last election. Um, accessible vote by mail became a very big issue, and that's a topic that we're working on, um, not necessarily with the legislature, although we are pushing the legislature for some changes um, to that program as well. Um, but it's been in statute for about 20 years that Florida is supposed to have an accessible vote by mail program. Um, we haven't implemented that. Um, there was a lawsuit involving um, the Florida Council of the Blind. Um, so we had five counties that participated in accessible vote by mail pilot programs. I'm gonna see if I can remember them all off the top of my head. Miami-Dade, Pinellas, Nassau, Volusia, and Orange counties um, were the five that participated. And Florida is supposed to have accessible vote by mail statewide for the upcoming election, which is supposed to be implemented by the end of this month. Um, so we're going to see how that goes, and that's going to be a huge focus of a lot of our voting rights work um, for the rest of this year. So for the bill that just passed this session, um, when it comes to disability specific issues, actually um, wasn't too terrible. Um, there, there originally were some issues that we had with the bill um, regarding vote by mail. Um, so the, the change that was originally proposed in the bill um, was that when you receive your vote by mail ballot, um, there would be three envelopes inside. So there's the privacy envelope, which you're supposed to use, but it's optional. If you don't put your ballot in the privacy envelope, no SOE's office is going to reject your ballot because of that. 
Um, however, the proposed language changed that. So you had to use the privacy envelope. Then you had to put the privacy envelope into a new envelope um, that was being referred to as the certificate envelope, which you had to sign and you had to put either the last four digits of your state ID or your social security number on it. Um, you can imagine where this would be difficult for some of our visually impaired and blind folks. Um, and it had to be on the certificate envelope. So if someone accidentally put it on the privacy envelope, their ballot would have been rejected. Um, and then these two envelopes went into the return envelope. Um, so again, a huge issue for those that were blind, visually impaired. We brought this up to the bill sponsor. Um, apparently he had gotten a lot of comments already from people and that part of the bill was removed, which was one of our biggest issues with it. Um, we still have some concerns regarding the bill. Um, so it does make changes to how frequently um, SOEs have to update their voter rolls. Um, so the list of voters that are registered um, instead of every election cycle now, it's, it's every year that they have to update those. Um, there's uh, some changes to vote by mail that will be happening. Um, so instead of doing the envelopes and you know putting your ID and signing and all of this, um, they, they punted this to the Secretary of State um, who has to come up with a plan of how to ensure that our vote by mail is secure. Um, so researching you know, what other states are doing, what works, what doesn't, um, kind of best practices um, and develop a plan for that. So we're obviously gonna see what comes of that. We'll of course be participating in public comment periods um, regarding those changes. Um, and then it changes the name to um, for the drop boxes um, to, and I am drawing a blank on this and I actually just said it earlier, um, but it's uh, ballot deposit stations or something, I don't know, some strange name. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the bill in front of me, um, so I forgot the name of it, but it, it changes the name for that. Um, and it also gets rid of um, ranked choice voting, um, which a, a county in Florida actually had passed um, ranked choice voting um, ordinance for their local elections. Um, so that does away with that ordinance, it, it goes proof it no longer exists, um, and no other city or county um, can pass a, a ranked choice voting um, ordinance in the state, nor can the state do that unless they repeal what just passed this session. Um, so that's where we are with elections. I want to pause just in case there's any questions. Okay, um, and you can hold questions if you want to until the end, that's fine as well. Um, I just want to give people that opportunity. I don't want, I know well, I'm thinking of something and then half an hour later, I'll forget what I was going to ask. So um, when I pause, please feel free to jump in and, and talk about those. Um, some of the things I'm going to talk about, Margaret touched on a little bit, so I'm not going to go like super in depth with some of them. Um, for our courts and kind of general government bills that we were following, um, Disability Rights Florida has been part of the Florida Hate Crimes Coalition for about a decade now. Um, we have been trying to change the statute. Right now in our, um, we call it crimes evidencing prejudice statutes um, or hate crimes, um, people with disabilities aren't covered under the statute unless you have been deemed um, adjudicated mentally incapacitated. Um, so anybody else with a disability that has capacity, um, people with physical disabilities, hearing impairments, visual impairments, um, any of these types of disabilities, unless you have been adjudicated mentally incapacitated, you are not covered under hate crimes. Um, and this is important for us because we know that hate crimes for people with disabilities are on the rise. They are significantly underreported. Um, you know, people with disabilities, 70% have experienced um, a, a violent crime, you know, they've been the victim of assault or abuse. Um, so we want to make sure that definitely people with disabilities are covered in this. Um, bills were filed. They've been filed for, I think, 10 sessions now. Um, and unfortunately, we haven't been able to get this bill to move. Um, so it'll probably be something that will come back next session. Of course, we'll push for it again. Um, but we, we've kind of stalled with that, but that's not unusual. Um, as we'll talk about one of the education bills in a moment, we, we pushed for that for 10 years and it finally passed um, between last session and this session. 
Um, so we're not giving up hope on our hate crimes bill, but it's definitely going to be a process. Um, another bill that's going to be a process that Margaret touched on um, is the supported decision-making bill. Uh, right now in Florida, um, people can use supported decision-making. There's nothing in statute that prohibits its use. Um, however, we wanna see it codified because right now the way we kind of have to implement supported decision-making agreements is imperfect. Um, so because this isn't codified, supported decision-making agreements in themselves are not legally recognized documents. So we kind of have to cobble them together with other documents that aren't necessarily what we want. So a lot of times we'll use powers of attorney, um, but a power of attorney gives substitute decision-making, which is not what supported decision-making does. Um, the big difference between this and like guardianship or a power of attorney or any other type of substitute decision-making legal document, um, the agent or the guardian has decision-making authority. So either if you're under guardianship, that person makes your decisions for you. Um, with a power of attorney, they can have shared decision-making authority, but they can still make decisions on behalf of that person. Um, with supported decision-making, um, the supporters give support, just like it says, to the decision maker, the person with a disability. Um, usually this results in like a team of people, so it's not one person that's serving as a supporter. Um, so like in guardianship where it's that single person, um, you know, when we have bad actors involved in these processes, we see that people are isolated from family, from friends. It's that one person that's controlling their life. Um, when we have supported decision-making agreements, particularly with a team of people, they kind of serve as a check and balance on each other, right? So we know that decision makers talking to all of those supporters, um, sometimes they'll meet as a team to discuss, you know, decisions that this person needs to make. Um, so they're, they're kind of keeping an eye on each other to make sure that people aren't abusing or exploiting this individual. Um, and that person remain, can, uh, maintains control over their own decisions. So the, the supporters can help them collect documents. So, you know, if they need someone to collect their school records or healthcare documents, um, they can review contracts with them and, and kind of help them understand like what's in that contract and provide them all the information that they need to make an informed decision. So just like, you know, we're not all experts in every area of our life. Um, when my car's making a funny noise, I don't know necessarily what that means. I take it to the mechanic. It's making this weird squeaky noise, go fix it. Um, and it, it's very much like that where we go seek advice from other people to help us make our life decisions. Everybody uses supported decision-making. Um, this just kind of create or would create a, a formal document that can be used. And this is particularly important for people that may be at risk for um, being placed under guardianship. Um, as Margaret said, we, we tried this with Chapter 744, which is kind of the big comprehensive guardianship statute, um, and, and we did get some resistance from probate attorneys and elder law um, who were concerned about people with dementia that have the declining um, cognitive abilities, that as that disease progresses, they're going to need more and more support, um, and their concern was that people would fall through the cracks. Um, we then moved to chapter 393. So this is more for the guardian advocacy program. And a lot of people think guardian advocacy is better than guardianship um, because people do have to retain one right. However, there are some due process concerns with guardian advocacy. Um, there does not have to be a finding of incapacity to put someone under guardian advocacy. So you could have, you know, someone's IEP from when they were in school to show that they were receiving special education services. Maybe you have an IQ test from 15 years ago. Um, you know, a, a doctor has provided some evidence, but there hasn't really been necessarily a formal assessment to determine whether or not that person is incapacitated. Um, and they're, they're basically being placed under guardian adv advocacy based on a diagnosis. Um, and we're seeing people that are capable of making their own decisions being placed under unnecessary and overly restrictive guardianship. So that's what we're trying to put an end to. Um, this obviously isn't going to work for everyone. Um, this is for people that have the capacity to make those decisions. Um, you know, capacity is in a black and white issue. People can have capacity in certain areas and not in others. 
Um, you know, they may be able to make financial decisions, but they don't understand contracts. Um, so they need somebody to help them with that. And so this becomes kind of another tool in the toolbox. So it can be used with, you know, a limited guardianship. Um, sometimes these agreements are drafted with actual guardians um, to help transition people out of a guardianship um, and help them acquire the skills to make their own decisions. Um, you know, they can be used side by side with the power of attorney. Um, so it, it, it kind of helps provide that, that level of support that they need and to give them that capacity that they need if they're just, you know, they, they can kind of almost get there, but they just need that little bump of support. Um, and, and so that's the population that we're targeting. Oftentimes we see um, students, particularly those that are um, staying in school past age 18, um, that the school systems are telling people um, or telling parents that in order to stay involved with your child's education, you need a guardianship. That's not true. Um, and that ties into the IEP bill a little bit and, and the purpose for that. Um, so, so we're trying to basically put a stop to that um, to make sure that we're not having people funneled into these programs. Um, there's instances of people that are in um, the foster care system that are aging out that are placed under these guardian advocacy as well. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're kind of stopping that flow into guardianship for those that don't need it. Um, as Margaret said, we, we had the big comprehensive 744 bill that didn't go anywhere last session. This session, we moved it to 393 for intellectual and developmental disability. We did get a committee hearing. Um, we are actually voted out of committee unanimously. Um, we hope to make some more progress next session. Um, I think we have our, our bill sponsor secured. Um, to kind of move forward. And a, a lot of people that heard the bill or some of the members that were on that committee actually are interested in potentially co-sponsoring the bill next session. So we put ourselves in a really good posture to hopefully maybe make it through a second committee meeting. Um, so this may be a bill that we're bringing back, you know, multiple sessions before we get it across the finish line, um, but there is momentum behind this. Um, so 20 states, or I think 19 states in the um, District of Columbia actually have SDM statutes now. Canada has been using SDM for um, about 30 years. Other countries are um, reforming their guardianship statutes. Um, any country that um, ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, um, that has basically stated that guardianship should only be used when absolutely necessary, basically calling guardianship unconstitutional, um, that we can't just strip people of their rights without a reason to do so, um, or you know, a, a really strong reason to do so. Um, so that's a trend that we're seeing. So I'm hopeful that we will eventually get this across the finish line, but it may take a few sessions to do that. Um, any questions about SDM before I move on? All right, um, a couple of the other bills that we were talking about, there was a um, data transparency bill that passed that we were actually glad to see um, make it across the finish line. And this was one of the recommendations from the Guardianship Improvement Task Force um, that we don't do a great job at data collection when it comes to guardianship. Um, in Florida and numerous other states, we have no idea how many people are actually placed under guardianship, particularly when we factor in family guardians, um, a lot of people are really falling through the cracks. Um, so this bill creates a database of guardians, um, how many you know, wards they have, um, if they've had any complaints filed against them, if they're under investigation, the results of those investigations. Um, so courts have the information that they need um, when assigning a guardian to someone to make sure that that person's going to be the appropriate person to serve as that guardian. Um, so that's really a, a huge first step in improving and reforming our, our guardianship statute. So we were really happy to see that pass. Um, one of the bills that Margaret was talking about, the IEP bill, um, 1317, I believe, was the bill number. Um, this actually started as an educational proxy bill. Um, so we, we wanted to create a document. Um, it, it's kind of in between a supported decision-making agreement and a power of attorney specifically for education. So as I mentioned, you know, we run into these scenarios where um, the school systems are telling people, you know, you have to get guardianship. Um, this would provide a tool so that student can say, 
they want their mom or they, their dad or whoever to be able to make decisions for them. So they can use this to grant that parent permission to sit on IEP meetings on their behalf or with them and to make decisions from that meeting if they so choose. Um, or they could just decide that, hey, I want my mom here, but I want them to serve more as like a supporter role and I wanna be the final decision maker on that. So it provided them a little bit of flexibility and gave that student control um, over who controlled those decisions. Um, unfortunately, we, we met the same resistance with that um, that we have with the supported decision-making bill. Um, so this became more of a resource bill. So when um, students hit transition age, um, the way the bill is structured is now, um, the, the school system would have to provide them options on um, you know, how, to, how to stay involved with their child's education. So they can have their child sign a FERPA release form, they can use a power of attorney, um, they can use a guardianship. Um, we stayed neutral on this bill just because there was not the supported decision-making component to it. Um, we understand why that wasn't pushed and put in there that, um, you know, the bill sponsor was told that the bill would be opposed if supported decision-making made it into the bill. Um, so we understand why that wasn't placed in there. Um, it's more really of a messaging bill, like the school systems are already supposed to be doing this, this exists in statute. So it's really kind of duplicative of language that's already in statute that happens all the time. So it's kind of a way of reinforcing to the school systems that you're supposed to be doing this. We know you're supposed to be doing this. We're going to put it in another statute confirming that, yes, you're supposed to be doing this. Um, so it's not the educational proxy bill, um, but at least it kind of reaffirms what the school systems are supposed to be doing, and hopefully it'll help ebb some of that flow into unnecessary guardianships that, you know, people are being funneled in through the school system. Um, so anything on guardianship IEPs before I jump over to healthcare? Um, and then it, we will pass it over to um, Caitlin. Um, some of the bills that we were watching, um, Margaret had touched on. Um, one of the bills that we worked on was Medicaid buy-in. Um, there is um, weirdly some interest actually in Medicaid buy-in for the legislature. Um, we didn't move it for this session, um, but there is the potential to move it forward. So Medicaid buy-in is created through the Ticket to Work program, which was created in the 1990s as a way to help people with disabilities transition into work while still keeping their Medicaid. Um, it didn't require Medicaid buy-in, but it did make it an option for the states. So since Florida didn't do Medicaid buy-in, the problem that we have in Florida for Ticket to Work is that people can keep Medicaid for two years after they enter the workforce, but then they lose Medicaid. So when we have people who need PCA care or, or you know, really expensive um, treatment or equipment that isn't covered by private insurance, they lose Medicaid, they kind of lose the services and supports that allowed them to go to work in the first place. Um, so this is a way to kind of fix that problem um, there's lots of ways that this can be structured. So the bill itself was very simple. It, it charged ACA with create a Medicaid buy-in program under Ticket to Work. So, Medi or so ACA would actually create the rules for this. Um, and, and every state does this differently. Some have income limits, um, some have sliding scales. So, you know, with an income limit, you're still hitting what we call the financial cliff. So if you make $1 over that income limit, um, you, you lose your benefits. Um, usually this does increase the amount that people can earn, but you know, it, it only does so up to a certain point and then they still face that financial cliff. So they'll find themselves in a situation where they wanna to contribute to their 401k at work, but they can't because they'll have, the asset limit will be reached and, and they can't do that. Or um, you know, they, they can't accept a raise. You know, they're at the max salary that they can receive before losing those benefits. Um, so a lot of states have done a sliding scale for Medicaid premiums for this um, to kind of avoid that problem. So once you hit a certain income limit, um, you're paying full premiums. So it's just as expensive as if, as if you were buying health insurance through your employer. The premiums can be six, $700 a month sometimes. But this is paying for PCA care, 
Um, this is paying for you know, durable medical equipment, things that your private insurance may not provide. Um, and a lot of states use this as a wraparound to employee-sponsored health insurance. So I, I have you know, insurance through my employer, um, but there's some things that it doesn't pay for. So I have to go through usually voc rehab um, to pay for those services. Um, this would allow your, your employee-sponsored or employer-sponsored um, health insurance to cover your doctor's appointments and your labs and diagnostic testing and you know all those sorts of things. But then Medicaid would kind of serve as a wraparound to pay for things that your private insurance doesn't. So such as PCAs, um, such as durable medical equipment and those types of things. Um, so there's a lot of ways that this can be structured and it can go horribly wrong or it can be wonderful. Um, so we're hoping to see this pass. And then of course there'll be um, public forums and comment periods on how the rules will be drafted and how this will be created in Florida if we can get it across the finish line. Um, so, but it, it would help dig people with disabilities out of poverty, allow people that want to and can enter the workforce to be able to do so without that fear of losing benefits. So we're really hoping that, that this will pass eventually. Um, the other one that we were kind of watching in regard to healthcare, um, in addition, of course, to, you know, the budget and how this would affects APD and, and indirect service providers, of course, um, but the nursing home bill. Um, and this is an interesting bill and it will be interesting to see how this progresses in the next few months um, because it, it decreases the amount of one-on-one um, -on -one time that nursing home staff have to spend with a resident. So right now it's at 2.5 hours. Um, it would change it to two hours um, and also would include physical therapists and occupational therapists and, you know, respiratory therapists, anybody that provides um, service to someone. So if you're in, you know, physical therapy for 45 minutes that day, you know, you've already gone through 45 minutes of your two hours um, and you have an hour and 25 minutes for someone to help you get out of bed and get back into bed and take a shower and eat. And so you can see how quickly that, that two hours could really be eaten up. Um, what's really gonna be interesting is that the Biden administration actually just announced nursing home reforms um, that he has directed CMS to, to um, develop. And part of that is to actually increase um, the one-on-one -on -one time that nursing home staff um, have to spend. So it'll be interesting to see how, you know, what is generated from HHS, CMS, um, potentially from Congress, and, and if that is going to conflict with what Florida just passed. Um, so this may be something that is kind of overruled by federal law um, within the next year or so. Um, so we're kind of watching and keeping an eye on that. And of course, you know, we'll participate in, in the HHS public comment periods um, and, and share our, our thoughts and opinions on that. Um, Caitlin, is there anything that I missed in that? And if not, I'm going to toss it over to you. I don't think so. I think we got it. All right, you're up. All right. Hi, everyone. I am Caitlin Clibbin. Um, I also am with Disability Rights Florida, like Olivia, the, the Statewide Protection and Advocacy Network. Um, and as she said, I tend to focus more on children's issues and mental health issues and criminal justice issues. So I'm going to talk some about those, but it should be pretty short because Margaret talked about a few of them already. And I'll just add a point or two. Um, so yeah, um, first I'll just, I'll talk about um, the, the restraint bill that Margaret mentioned earlier. Um, it bans use of mechanical restraints by school personnel um, on children with disabilities in public and charter schools. Uh, it does not apply to private schools. Um, and um, yeah, so and like Margaret said, law enforcement can still use um, mechanical restraint in the exercise of their duties but only on children in grades six through 12. Um, and then um, the, another one that I'll mention is the, um, Margaret also mentioned, it's the, the bill that allows RBTs to come into the classrooms um, 
And that bill was, it was important because my understanding is that RBTs are the ones who provide a lot of the one-on-one -on -one therapy. Um, and so now, you know, some counties were allowing them to come in and work directly with students in the classroom and some counties were not. So now every county will have to allow that. Um, I will say though that it's limited. It, the, the, the RBTs that can go into the classrooms have to be um, employed by a Medicaid provider. It doesn't mean that they have to be actually billing Medicaid. Um, it just says they have to be employed by a Medicaid provider um, in order to be able to go into the classroom. And that's the only class of private instructional personnel that's limited in that way. Um, and I'm not sure why, but um, just so you know, that's, that's a limitation there on that. Um, another quick one um, was, uh, is a little bill about um, plans for students with seizure disorders. So any student who has a seizure disorder, their parent has to, or parent may um, request that the school and, um, have like a plan in place that everyone who works with that student is aware of and is trained on. Um, and, you know, they, they can set out whatever guidelines or, or recommendations by the doctor that the school should do if the child has a seizure there on campus. Um, and those plans are supposed to stay in place um, indefinitely unless the parent changes them. So you don't have to go back year after year and make a new plan. Um, and then in education, the last thing I was going to talk about, um, you know, and like I said, Margaret mentioned some of them already, so I'm going to skip some of the, the IEP bills and that sort of thing. But the other <laughs> bill that we were watching in education was the, the parental rights bill in education. And this one had um, a lot of media attention, a lot of big hubbub about it, um, and a lot of people um, you know, decrying some things that they feel like are not positive with the bill. However, we, you know, when I look at it, I see some, some good things in there as far as um, educational rights and parents being able to vindicate those educational rights if they so choose. Um, so what I see in there is that um, basically the bill is, the, the language in the bill says that um, anything that has to do with the, the school's uh, or the student's services, their mental, emotional, physical health or well-being, um, or the school's ability to provide a learning environment. So if those things are, are at issue, um, they, the schools can't restrict a parent's involvement in any of those things, you know, mental, emotional, physical health, well-being, um, and they can't um, discourage parent involvement in any of those things. They can't hold back records that have to do with any of those things, and um, those are really broad ideas. So, you know, a parent's involvement in mental, emotional, physical health, or well-being encompasses a lot of a lot of issues. And this bill this year adds a private right of action, meaning that if parents don't like what the school district has done, um, they don't have to go through administrative procedures. They can go to court. Um, so they can um, sue the district for you know fail, failure to abide by you know, what I was just describing, their, their right to be involved in um, mental, physical, emotional health and well-being of the student at school. So um, I think that that could be a good thing for, for students and parents who, who have services or want services in school. Um, and I, so on, on mental health bills, I, I, there are several bills that passed. A lot of them are very small and just do one or two things. And I'll just say that, you know, the, for the last year, there's been a um, mental health and substance abuse commission that has been meeting. Um, they've been meeting really frequently and they are developing, you know, a comprehensive set of recommendations for how to improve our, you know, whole mental health system statewide. And I think because of that, um, lawmakers were uh, hesitant to do any major reform this year because they know they're, that within the next six months or, or eight months, they're going to get a big report with a lot of recommendations. So I think they were kind of waiting on that to do anything major. Um, and because of that, unfortunately, a bill that we really liked didn't get any sort of attention and it did not pass. Um, there was a bill uh, 1459 um, and that bill was, um, it was an attempt at a kind of creating a Baker Act for children. 
So um, anytime a person who's eight, under 18 was gonna be subject to the Baker Act to be involuntarily examined or committed, it would have put in a whole bunch of procedures to protect, um, to protect them from the traumatic effects of, of that process. You know, what can be, can often be very traumatic. Um, it did things like, you know, making it so they couldn't handcuff the kid unless it was absolutely necessary, um, not putting them in the back of a police car if it was not necessary, um, letting the parent take them to the facility um, or a friend or a counselor instead of the police, um, those sorts of things. Um, you know, because if a big act is necessary and they do need to go, there are still ways to kind of make that process a little less um, difficult for the kid. And like I said, unfortunately, that did not pass, um, which we would have really liked to see that. And that's something that we intend to continue to work on. And, you know, I, I also don't want to um, lead to the impression and leave the impression that we only care about how this impacts children. Um, we absolutely think that the process of being big actor could be traumatic for adults too. Um, but I think that there's an incremental approach that people often try to take in the legislature um, when, when something is difficult, you know? Sometimes it's easier to do something for kids first and then if it turns out okay, maybe we can expand it to adults. So, um, you know, that's, that's why the focus was there on kids. And then, <laughs> so some of the bills that did pass um, like I said, a lot of them were small and just did like one or two things. So I'm going to run through a little list real quick. Um, we had one that added peer specialists to the continuum of care. So our care system in Florida that includes all the different service providers and players, um, now they've added peer specialists into that, that system. And peer specialists are people who have lived experience with substance abuse and mental health disorders. Um, who could be a part of the team for the person, the treatment team for a person who's going through treatment for mental health or substance abuse disorders. Um, so, and that's, there's a lot of research about why that is good. And um, that's something that our Senator Rousan, um was pushing for a very long time. And um, like I, I'm hoping to see that really help and be effective for some people who are getting care. Um, we had a quick bill about prescription drugs for um, schizophrenia. Some people know about step therapy where you're required to use, be prescribed certain drugs in a certain order. And, you know, even if you know that the fourth one on the list is the one that really helps you and you've had it before, you still have to try drugs one, two, and three before you can get there. And that could be really detrimental to people who need consistent medication, especially for those with schizophrenia. So, we eliminated that requirement for step therapy for people getting um, prescriptions for um, uh, schizophrenia, which is great. Another thing is um, um, uh, one of the, the bills that went directly to the Baker Act to involuntary examination commitment talks a lot about um, communication, making sure that people who are in the process of being Baker Act and who are in a facility, that their communication cannot be restricted unless it's for a clinical reason, like it's gonna affect their well-being. Um, and, you know, that helps prevent any sort of like, you know, bad stuff from going on in the facility, making sure people can reach out to their loved ones and ask for help if they need it. And even it's just good for their recovery to be able to be in touch with the, the people in their life who are supportive of them. Um, that bill also would make it a first degree misdemeanor to falsely report information to have someone they corrected. And um, it also, I thought very nicely, creates minimum requirements for discharge planning. Um, there were no, I suppose, I guess there were no minimum requirements for discharge planning in the statute before. So now they've put in, it's, it's pretty basic, but you know, they have to provide information about where you can get your follow-up, go to for your follow-up appointments, where you can go to get any medication you were prescribed, and um, also information about affordable living arrangements, transportation, and, and any sort of like support system that's available in your community. Um, so those, those minimum requirements are gonna have to be met anytime someone's discharged from involuntary examination or involuntary commitment. And then the last one I'm gonna talk about is a little bill about um, voluntary admission for mental health treatment. So, under the Baker Act, you can be involuntary, involuntarily committed, but you can also voluntarily ask to be committed. And um, for children, they have changed the rules a little bit this year where 
um, a parent can basically just go and do the voluntary admission of the child for any child 17 or under. And um, the parent has to provide their informed consent. Um, and then the child is required to give their assent, which is different than con consent. Um, but previously, the child's um, consent, uh, previously, uh, the child was required to, required to consent, and that consent was supposed to be reviewed by a court. Now there's no longer a court hearing required. It's called a, they've put instead what they call a clinical review. That term was not defined in, in the bill. So um, we're all kind of assuming it just means someone there in the clinical setting would review whether that child's assent was voluntary. Um, we were a little bit worried about that. It reduces the due process protections for children um, in the Baker Act proceedings. Um, but, and another concern about that is, is data. We, um, we know that there are an extraordinary amount of involuntary commitments of children in Florida, like way more than any other state in the entire country, like way more. It's, it's a lot. It's, I think, about 30,000 a year um, different commitment incidents for children. And um, so obviously, I think we want to know as an organization, we want to know why that's happening and try to bring those numbers down and see what about our system isn't working quite right um, to lead to the point where there's so many kids in crisis at this crisis point every year. And so um, voluntary admissions are not tracked in our state. We do have some pretty good tracking of involuntary admissions, but our concern is that by um, now having those be voluntary admissions where the parent just kind of signs them in, we're gonna lose sight of all those kids. And it's gonna make it harder for us to answer that question of why this is happening. Um, but that bill does one good thing too, which is um, it requires that anyone, adult or child, who's being transported for Baker Act has to be transported, transported in the least restrictive manner available um, under the circumstances. So that means that if they're not violent and they're not um, struggling and they're agreeing to go, then there's no reason to put them in handcuffs. You know, so so hopefully we can reduce some of the traumatic impacts um, or like circumstances around the Baker Act with just that one little sentence saying least restrictive transportation. Um, and we're you know interested to see how that plays out and whether they are start using, you know, maybe not use ambulances instead of police cars or or something that's a little less stigmatizing. Um, so that's all, and, and you know, my other area is criminal justice reform. There really wasn't much meaningful criminal justice reform this year, um, and that's unfortunate. But um, I, I I didn't have anything that I thought was um, you know super exciting to talk about here today, so I'm not going to ramble about that. But I do want to give Olivia an opportunity to talk about the registry bill a little bit because we spent and she spent a significant amount of time on that, and I think she might have forgotten to say what she wanted to say about that. And I would never try to speak for her. I can't believe I forgot the registry bill. Like that was 70% of my session and I'm like, yay, it's behind me. And I just, poof, it went away, um, <laughs> which it did go away. So, you know, that's the good thing. Uh, so the special needs registry bill. So these have been popping up all over the country. Um, however, there's no data and we have gone digging and we had our four policy interns digging for data on these to see if they are in fact effective. Are they doing what they're claiming to do of decreasing negative interactions between people with disabilities and law enforcement? And so far there is no data to back up that assertion. So we are very hesitant to create a registry of people with disabilities to pass on to law enforcement when there is no data to back up that this is effective considering the, the negative interactions between people with disabilities and law enforcement that currently exist. Um, some of the issues that we had with the original version of the bill specifically. Um, so in Florida, you if you have a developmental disability, you can have a D placed on your driver's license or state ID. And this was a bill that passed a couple of years ago. Um, it was a bill that we opposed. Um, we, we did not support this. It's voluntary, um, so people are not forced to do this. However, 
what wasn't really being thought about is how many times you have to show your ID to people. Um, you know, you go to the airport, you, you've shown your state ID or driver's license five times by the time you get to the gate. Um, when you're checking into a hotel, uh, when you are newly employed, one of the first things in your new hire packet, your, your employer wants a copy of your driver's license or your ID. Um, you may not have wanted to disclose your disability to these individuals that you're interacting and engaging with, but with that on there, you just have. Um, there is a mechanism to remove it. Um, people can request to have this taken off. If somebody's parent added them when they were 16, um, they turn 18, they can take it off. Um, so we're, we're, you know, hoping that people will just kind of learn, <laughs> um, you know, that the the consequences of this and whether that's something that they want to live with and they and they feel that this is something that protects them or you know it has been a hindrance it's created additional barriers which is our concern with this and um, that it will create additional barriers to things like voting and employment and housing um, um, but this this exists so when the bill the first version was expanding upon this so people could have an ad added to their their license or their state ID for Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, again, we understand the intent. Um, we think there, there was very good intent regarding this, but just not really thinking about the unintended consequences for this. Um, there was also no training component to this. So, okay, law enforcement knows that you have a disability. They know that you're on the autism spectrum. They know that you're deaf, okay? And if they haven't been trained on how to work with this population, their only experience with someone on the autism spectrum, and we've actually heard um, people, you know, anecdotally tell us this when they've engaged with law enforcement, if they have a child with a disability um, that they've had to call law enforcement before, where law enforcement has argued with them saying, oh no, they don't have autism, my nephew has autism and they don't have anything like you know, your kid. Um, so without proper training, it, it can lead to very dangerous situations. An example of this is, you know, their, their five-year-old nephew has autism and this kid bites and screams and punches and kicks people. Um, that is their experience with autism. And that's what they think everyone on the autism spectrum is like. They get called um, to, to something to respond to. Um, they're notified that the individual they're getting ready to engage with has autism. Um, but this one, this person may be, you know, shy and reserved and withdrawn, um, but they don't have great social skills. Maybe they're nonverbal and they see the law enforcement officer's flashlight or his badge and, and they're curious about it and they reach for it. How might the situation go horribly wrong? Um, there was an instance with a man in Sanford, um, maybe a, a, I think it's been a decade ago, which it doesn't seem like it should be that long, but it was. Um, and, and this individual was deaf um, and he, he, he was verbal, um, but he, you know, can't control his volume. So the officer thought that he was being aggressive and yelling at him. Um, this individual's son was with him um, and was explaining to the officer that he was deaf um, and, and he didn't believe him. And um, the, the individual had a concealed carry permit. So the officer saw the gun on his belt he never reached for it. He didn't threaten the officer. The officer shot and killed him um, in front of his son um, for being deaf. Um, so unfortunately, we see these situations a lot of the time, and there was no training component to this whatsoever. Um, Florida does have a requirement that officers receive um, 40 hours of training on autism and other disabilities, um, but it doesn't specify what other disabilities have to be covered in that. Disability is a very wide spectrum, so there's a lot of people that are falling in the cracks um, when it comes to proper training, and we're seeing this as a result. Um, half of the people killed by law enforcement officers every year are people with disabilities. Um, about half of the people that are incarcerated in jails, prisons, are people with disabilities. We know that these negative interactions exist. Um, so it didn't have the training component. As Margaret said, um, when somebody would have had this D or this AD added to their license, um, they would automatically have been added to the Florida Criminal Information Center system. 
which is a database for law enforcement where they track wanted criminals and missing people and missing property. Um, not really a place for a disability registry. This is a database that employers use when they do background checks. So again, you may not have wanted your employer to know that you had a disability, boop, you pop up on the, the Florida Criminal Information Center system. Um, and it may have identified you as a person with a disability. Um, so now we've disclosed your disability. This is a publicly searchable database. Um, so now we're making, you know, PHI um, searchable to the public. Um, so there are a lot of problems with this. If we did a public records exemption, maybe we can hide the fact that yes, this person has a disability, but now this prospective employer doesn't know why you're on the FCIC. You're just in the system and they, they have no idea. Did you commit a crime? Like, why is this redacted? Um, so you can see where that would be very problematic. Um, there was no way for people to get off of this list. So you were added once you added the D on your license automatically and people that already had the D would have been added um, and you wouldn't have been notified that you were on it. Uh, caregivers, parents, um, there was just wide range of people, caregivers who could add you to the database without your consent. Um, so there were a lot of problems with the bill. It was redrafted um, with a delete all. Um, registries do exist in Florida already, but they're local. And so the new draft of the bill would have permitted the registries to exist, which there's nothing prohibiting them now. Um, but the, the new version of the bill provided some guardrails to these that already exist. So like the caregivers and the parents being able to add you, it would have restricted that. If you were over the age eight, over age 18, the only person that could add you is yourself, um, unless you've been adjudicated mentally incapacitated, in which case your guardian, your parent um, could add you. You had to be notified once you turned 18 if your parent had added you to this list um, within five days of your 18th birthday um, and provided with the process to remove yourself if you so choose to do so. Um, and and in, you know, there was the mechanism to remove yourself if you wanted to do that. So it was a much better bill. It did provide some guardrails. Um, we were still neutral on it. We didn't support it because we don't wanna encourage the creation of registries. We would rather see this problem addressed. We agree this is a problem, we're all in agreement on that, um, but how best to address it is kind of where we're differing. Um, the version of the bill that we ended up with, we could have lived with, however, there was a, a snafu. Um, so there was a public records exemption. So the problem that we're looking at right now is that if a city or county has a special needs registry for law enforcement. There's nothing stopping someone from doing a public records request and saying to that law enforcement agency, hey, give me your list of your, your special needs registry. Now there, there's certain information that would automatically be redacted from you know, chapter 119 of restricting you know, personal information that can be shared, but their information, you know, their name, would be shared and this potentially opens up people for exploitation um, and, and abuse and, and you know various other issues so and with public records exemptions bills these have to be standalone bills so they couldn't add the public records exemption to the registry bill so this was a bill that had to kind of travel with it and it did that in the senate um, through all three committees the problem is it didn't do it in the house and in order for a bill to be considered you know on the floor it has to have gone through at least one committee in the other chamber. So we went through all three committees, or almost actually, it's it stalled in the third committee um, in the Senate because of this issue. Um, so it could have made it to the Senate floor, but when it passed over to the House, it would not have that public records exemption attached to it. And there was no way to move that public records exemption bill that, for whatever reason, didn't move in the House. Um, there were no more committee stops where they could have moved it through. So the registry bill would have gone through without any protections from people doing a public records request for registry. So we didn't want to see, you know, 20 cities or, you know, counties or whatever create these registries and not have that exemption. The bill sponsors agreed. They, they understood our, our issue with that. Um, so the, the bills were um, TP'd in, in their last committee stops in both chambers. Um, but it is something that we do expect to see again. Um, like I said, if it, if it picks up where it left off, it, it's something that we can live with. We don't love it, but at least it does provide some guardrails for the registries that already exist. Um, but we would really like to see a law enforcement training component to this. 
Um, there are some states that have done very comprehensive law enforcement training statutes or legislation um, that's passed. Um, usually, unfortunately, it's because of a death of a person with a disability that, that spawns that. Um, but Maryland has a great one that is kind of the model for the country right now that we're kind of pushing for here um, that requires law enforcement to work with self-advocates um, with creating the, their training program. It's very comprehensive. It requires more hours. Um, you know, there's recertifications every couple of years and so on and so forth. Um, so that's something that we're really pushing for. We would like to see a training bill replace the registry bill and just not see the registry bill again. I don't think that's going to happen. I think we are going to see it, but it, at least it's in a much better posture if it does pass, um, that it's not going to add people to a criminal database or put a identification, you know, that you pre presents your PHI to everyone you show your ID to. Um, so we, we did eliminate those elements um, that were in the bill this session. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin, Olivia, Margaret. I really appreciate that comprehensive overview of the session. That was really, really helpful. Um, for the interest of time, I, I want to go into um, Matt's presentation. So Matt is going to kind of shift gears a little bit. And we're going to talk about the anatomy of a successful appropriations project. So this is really geared towards um, you all as providers, um, potentially, or, or service organizations that are looking to obtain funding from the state legislature. Uh, Matt, take it away. Sure. Thanks, Gary. And thanks, everyone, for being on the call today. I know we've been spending the last, uh, I guess, hour and 40 minutes talking about substantive bills and Tallahassee from a macro perspective and sort of what's gone on at 50,000 feet. Um, but I'm going to take the next, we'll say, 10 minutes or so to just kind of drill way, way down and talk about um, how, I guess, you all as different providers, nonprofits, organizations can utilize this process potentially to your individual advantage, especially in the world of appropriations. So um, just to introduce myself briefly, my name is Matt Spritz. I'm the managing partner of the Spritz Group. Um, I'm what uh, Olivia, Caitlin, and Margaret would call a contract or an outside lobbyist. So um, I'm generally hired by companies, nonprofits, uh, associations, et cetera, um, when they are looking for, I guess, help with an individual issue or a specific project. This past session uh, had the privilege to work with Unicorn Children's Foundation, um, and we were very successful in, in getting an appropriations project funded in the legislature. So. Um, so what does that mean exactly? It means that um, when you talk about budgeting, you talk about state agencies, you talk about you know, the state spending money on these huge initiatives, but what the state can also do and what individual members can do is they can actually write in as a line item on the budget itself an individual project for a nonprofit, for an association, for a municipality. Many water projects are funded in this way. Um, and so too in the world of, of child welfare, disabilities, education, projects are funded this way as well. So um, let me, I'm gonna share my screen. Let me see if I can do this successfully. Oh no, it says host disabled. Carrie, can you, can you let me, uh, am I good? All right, let me, okay. So I wanna share screen two, all right. All right, can everyone see the, the page that, Carrie, you see it? Okay, great. So this is just a quick little sheet that I've, I've put together. Um, and again, just a, a little bit about my background. Um, I'm a former ledge director for a state agency. I, I've worked on campaigns. I've worked as a policy aide inside the legislature. I'm a former House candidate myself. Um, and, and now, of course, managing partner of the Spritz Group. Um, so I, I can you know, kind of come at this from all different angles, and, and I've worn all the hats, so to speak. Um, but I want to start off by giving just a, a brief summary of the of the legislative process. Um, I know that, again, for the past hour and 40 minutes or so, uh, you know, we've heard a lot about, you know, different chambers and committees and delete all amendments. And I know a lot, a lot of people on the call, you know, some may be very well versed in what happens in Tallahassee, but some may not. So I want to break this down in a way that, that hopefully everyone can understand and, and, and benefit from. So just a quick summary of the legislative process. So um, Florida has a bicameral state legislature consisting of a 40 member Senate and 120 member house. Uh, for any item to become law, whether it's, uh, whether it's a budget item or a substantive item, it must pass each chamber in identical form and be signed into law by the governor. So what that means 
is that whether it's an appropriations project or a substantive bill, whatever the, the item may be, it advances on what's known as a dual track through the Florida House and also through the Florida Senate simultaneously. And then ultimately, as it passes different committees, usually two or three in each chamber and gets to the floor of each chamber, it is then reconciled. Uh, the budget is also reconciled. Looks like maybe Matt is frozen. Matt, if you can hear us, you froze up a little bit. Yeah. Matt, it looks like you might still be talking. I think you are frozen. Okay, so it looks like he's gonna sign back in. Carrie, will we be getting his slideshow by any chance? Yeah, um, I'll make sure that he sends that out and our, um, we'll include that with the overview and the recording in the next newsletter. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome back, Matt. I think I'm sorry. I'm, I'm doing this from my, my home office, and we've been having horrendous internet issues. Um, so I, I, the internet just, just went out, unfortunately, again. But I'll, I'll do this quickly, and I'll, 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 I'll circulate the, the, the one pager that I put together after the presentation. Perfect. Um, so I believe I was just talking about how, in election years, um, uh, the legislature convenes a little bit earlier. Uh, there's a 60-day legislative session, and by law, uh, the legislature actually has to pass a balanced budget. So the, the, the state can't borrow money, the state can't, uh, you know, doesn't issue bonds, the state, you know, the state has to actually balance their budget, unlike the federal government, which does not, as I think we all know. Uh, leading up to the session, the legislature convenes in Tallahassee for a series of six to eight committee weeks. Um, this past session, they were in October, November, and December. And again, this is important because much of the budget work, uh, many of the, the projects that ultimately go into the budget actually happen during the committee weeks and not during session itself. Um, individual members of each chamber may sponsor projects to be written into the budget and be funded by the state. In order for a project to be a part of the budget, it must have a member sponsor in each chamber, one representative and one senator. So. If you're an organization that's looking to get state funding, essentially you need what's known as a sponsor. You need one member in the House and one member in the Senate um, to, to essentially run your project through each chamber. Um, typically it helps if um, there's a geographic scope to the project and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, it also, and I'm gonna be very candid um, you know, for, for everyone on the call, um, I know that there were some legislative names that were being thrown around but for, for member projects, it, it's actually helpful if you have a Republican sponsor, at least in one chamber, simply because in Florida, we have a supermajority uh, legislature of Republicans uh, in both chambers, and we have a Republican governor. So if you're potentially running a member project through the legislature with Democratic sponsors, um, you may not be as successful. So, uh, and again, I was going to share my screen, so you'll just, you'll have to listen to me. Uh, the characteristics of a successfully funded state project. So number one, the project should have an easily digestible public return on investment. So a large public benefit, geographically widespread, easily articulated. You have to remember that, that these are ultimately state dollars that are being appropriated. And so it has to be understood by the legislature um, you know, what their return on investment is. If they're investing half a million dollars into an organization or a project, um, even if we all know what that project does and, and, and we think it's fantastic, uh, whether it's from a, a you know, child welfare, special needs or educational perspective, they have to be able to digest that and understand that. Uh, number two, the project in question has to be a single project. So you can't go in and say, hey, you know, I want $50,000 for this building and then another $50,000 for this program. Um, it can be an actual program or a fixed capital cost but it can't be like a basket of stuff that you're just asking for. Um, number three, 
uh, the amount ultimately funded by the legislature, if you get that far, may only be a portion of the requested amount. So you can ask for a million dollars, um, but the legislature may say, okay, we're going to give you, you know, $100,000. So generally as a strategy when you're, when you're seeking state funding through appropriations, um, it, it's better to ask for, you know, whatever the higher number may be that you can justify on the, on the spreadsheet that, you're, that you fill out and all the paperwork. Um, because ultimately when it goes to the project, you probably end up with less than the full amount, but sometimes you get lucky and you get full funding. Um, as a general rule, 50% of funds that are requested from the state as a member project have to be matched. So uh, they can come from private donors, federal dollars, or local government dollars. But um, if you're asking, for example, um, the state to fund uh, $200,000, uh, then you want to have another $200,000 funded. So, um, you know, if the, if the total cost of the project is $400,000, at least 50% of that needs to be funded by, by sources other than the state. And that's something that, again, when you fill out paperwork for the state, um, that, uh, you know, that you have to, um, you have to make sure that, um, that, uh, that, it's, that it's matched appropriately. Um, you can ask for whatever you want, but the, the likelihood of success goes down if you are, um, if you're not asking, you know, for, if you don't have a 50% match. Um, next, the project should have widespread community support. So, um, you know, letters of support from community officials, community leaders, um, you know, other, other community members, other funders. Um, again, these are public dollars that you're asking for. Um, and lastly, again, I, this speaks to easily digestible ROI. Um, you know, if, if you're seeking state funding, um, you should generally have a an impactful short form piece of marketing collateral. So, hey, legislator X, you know, here's the you know here's the sheet of paper that that explains my project and why and why you should fund it. Um, so that's just a bit of an overview. Uh, you know, this isn't necessarily something that. Um, you know, is right for every organization. It's not something that's easy. Typically, organizations will ask for funding for many years before they receive funding from the legislature. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. I wouldn't advise doing it unless you have some sort of lobbyist or consultant that's that's involved that's helping you shepherd the process. It's not an easy thing. But I think it's just important, you know, again, and I, I, I thought it was something that that everyone on the call might be interested in because increasingly you do see nonprofits engaging lobbyists, you see nonprofits seeking funding from the state for individual initiatives that have a huge public sector impact. Um, and it's, you know, and it, and it is something to, to just sort of think about as you're, as you're planning your long-term, uh, I guess, fiscal outlook. Uh, and now's the time to think about something like this because ultimately, um, you know, there's a lot of runway and there's a lot of things that have to happen before the next session begins uh, next March. And so, um, you know, certainly, like I said, this isn't for everyone, but, um, you know, if you have an initiative or a project that has that sort of public ROI, um, you know, it might be worth it, uh, you know, to, to consider seeking state dollars. And I know that, um, you know, again, just having represented nonprofits, uh, having been involved in that community, it's something that a number of nonprofits um, are increasingly are increasingly doing, increasingly seeking, um, and being rewarded for it. Um, and so, um, you know, that is the the anatomy of a successful appropriations project, a successful member project. I'll circulate the one pager after the call. I'm sorry for my my internet trouble and my technical difficulties. But um, you know, again, we spent a lot of time on this call talking about substantive issues. You know, the sort of macro issue in Tallahassee. Um, so I, I, you know, I think it's important, you know, and again, this is just a little slice to, to really examine how, you know, some of these big budget issues um, could potentially trickle down and, and, and ultimately affect, you know, each individual organization if, if um, you know, if, if pursued properly. So that, that's my presentation. I think I did it in uh, 13 minutes. How did I do, Karen? Awesome, Matt. And I bet some folks have some questions. So let's open up the, the line here. Do you all have questions um, for any of our panelists? I see a hand raised. Nicole. All right, okay. I wrote down three questions, but they're quick ones. So with the new RBT um, 
law, House Bill 255, it had the addendum that the provider had to be enrolled in Medicaid. Does the RBT have to have an individual Medicaid number or is that just the provider? So that was one question to see if it would further restrict who can get into schools. Um, so the language right now just, or the link, yeah, the language as it is just says that the RBT has to be employed by an enrolled Medicaid provider. Okay. And then second question is for the peer specialists. We've used those a lot. So I'm wondering if this new bill increases the funding for people to get that NCPS or CPRS um, credentials. I, I, I did not see any funding associated with the bill on that one. Um, it, did, it does have details about um, like background check requirements, kind of loosening those up based on the circumstances kind of thing um, and some standards. Um, and if you give me a second, I'll pull up um, a link to the bill and put it in the chat so you can go look at it if you'd like okay. to. Yeah, please. Um, and then one for Matt, the, what you were talking about with the funding, is that synonymous with a budget bill? Like what they refer to as a budget bill? When uh, you're working like that? Um, when you say a budget bill, you're talking. I mean, it would be it would be an appropriations project. Okay. And yeah. what typically, it typically those bills will have higher numbers, right? So typically they'll they'll have like a three or a four or five or six in front of it, um, and that's how you'll know that those are those are individual budget bills. Although interestingly enough, they only have to be bills in the House. The Senate is still like the old system with smoke and mirrors and you just fill out the form and then there's like a number that's assigned. But the House, uh, for a little bit of greater transparency, there's a bill involved. Do you see more success with those getting funded if you have like a county commissioner or other local legislators requesting that funding or at least on that funding? And can they be on it if it's for a nonprofit? The, well, so the answer is they, they would generally well, county commissioners would write like a letter of support, right? Like they're they're not like requesting the funding, but they could like, you know, help you lobby for it in theory. Um, as far as like who your member sponsor would be, yeah, I mean, it would, it would generally be the local person. Although if you have a program that has a wide geographic scope, uh, uh, scope I would actually encourage you to not just go with your local people. I would, you know, cause then you can demonstrate that it has statewide impact. You have a better chance of getting funding, but this is all, I mean, this is the strategy that goes into it. Thank you, that's it. Sure. Any other questions? I know that I learned so much in just such a short time. So I wanna thank all of our speakers. Matt, thank you so much um, for coming in and, and giving us some information about how to move forward. I know that this is a long process, so I'm sure folks will have more questions. Um, and so they'll have your contact information there if you wanna put it into the chat. Um, Caitlin and Olivia, thank you all for coming. Um, we really enjoy your partnership, Disability Rights Florida, we always enjoy when your organization folks from you all come on, um, you're so knowledgeable um, and thank you for sharing that. Um, and I think that maybe Margaret signed off. I know she had another meeting, but I do wanna thank her um, and the council uh, for all that they do for us at the state level. And uh, you know, it's really important that we are communicating all of these things with our families as well so that um, they know how to advocate and who to reach out to. So, um, all right. I think all the all the comments are just saying thank you. It was super informative. And um, for everybody, just to let you know that this recording will be posted in our newsletter. So if anybody missed out, you can let them know to look there. And um, have a great month. And we hope to see you next month. So thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.